<laughs> Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. It's been a busy day, but a good busy, right? We've been learning, unlearning, and relearning. And um, when I got the invitation and I'm like, I'm the last person, I'm like, OK, I have to switch around how I normally do my PowerPoint so, so that I don't put you to sleep. So I tried to dig up some pictures. Who can tell me the name of that fall? Victoria. Who said, that, who said Niagara Falls? Who we'll send you back to where you came from? So that's Victoria Falls. It's, it borders between uh, Zimbabwe and Zambia. And from what I read up, so this is not about parenting, but I have to make, you, I have to make it engaging so that you don't fall asleep on me. So it's actually twice the size of Niagara Falls, both in height and in width. Yeah, spectacular. And I said to myself, if we could just develop tourism in Africa, I think we'll make a lot of money. Because the number of people that goes to Niagara Falls, and then there's winter that people can't really go, and then you know the weather in Africa is good all year round. So, food for thought. But I'm not here to talk about tourism. The black people of the world, we're from all over. And like you rightly said, there's African Americans. Some of us are from Africa, straight to wherever we are. Uh, some are from the Caribbean islands. We're all over. And like I said, when I was part of the panel in the morning, we all bleed the same. Our skin color might be different, but we are all still the same. And we just have to treat each other that way. An average African person holds their culture and tradition in high esteem. We don't joke with our culture, right? For those that know where their heritage is from, you have a connection with it. I think the lady that was here, uh, I forget her name now, was talking about how our mom is from Jamaica, her dad is Cree, but she doesn't have that connection. She misses that. So an average black person holds their culture in high regard. And as such, we want to pass it to our children. But then we've packed our loads, our luggage, and we've left our home countries. And now we're here. Mm. And now the children are in school. They're away from us for so long. And they're learning something different. And then there's a clash. How do we maneuver that? So here I said, typical black person. We've got culture. We've got traditions. We don't joke with that. We've got our language and how we interact. And referring back to what I said during the panel in the morning, when someone's talking to you, they're not just speaking English. They're not just speaking words. There's a mindset. They're sizing you up. I'm looking at you and I think you're a fashionista. Mm -hmm. I saw you when you walked in and I'm like, OK. <laughs> I didn't say that in words, but I said it in my mind. But if I don't come to you to say it, you wouldn't know that. So we have language, the way we interact. Sister, yet last night you called him Uncle Clyde, right? We've got that. That's part of our culture and tradition. We respect our elders. You were surprised that he was introduced as an elder. You added uncle, right? Now, I know Tony. I'm calling him Tony for the first time. When we're out of here, bros, sis. My bros, right? We have culture, we have tradition, we have respect. And we also live communal, like we're together. We're in each other's homes. I like last night, a lot of foundation has been laid about Tales by Moonlight when Joseph came up with his children. How do we get our children to embrace our heritage? When they came up there last night, I'm like, he's preached my message already. How, do we, how did he get those children to play drums with him? I have three girls, and they're totally different. So the one that's the social butterfly is super busy today. The one that is socially shy is the one that's free today. I needed someone to man my table, and I know better than to ask her. So I said, well, whatever. How do we carry on the heritage? Black people, we lay emphasis on hard work, excellence. Most of our schools, I believe, same thing in the Caribbean. The education system is still run with who came first, who came last. 
And for some of us that are here, let's not go back to what position you were in class when you were back in school. Some of us didn't have the privilege of being first. But we're here today. We're doing good. Yep. Children start education early. You know, in most of our African countries in the Caribbean, I will speak specifically for Nigeria, that's where I'm from, that from age two, three, kids are shoved into classrooms. Because life moves on, you're back to work after maternity leave. And I said it in the morning, so that child comes here, and they're six or five years old, and now they can't go to school, because you have to be six to go to school. So now that child is at home, and that child is bored. And then we see they're misbehaving. They're actually not misbehaving. They're just being kids. You've put them in a structure. You've uprooted them from that structure. They need a new structure that's not the same. They don't know what to do with it. We don't know what to do with it. And like my brother over there rightly said, the parents are struggling with professional exams. They have to study. So you don't have time. So what do we do? Cuckoo melon. <laughs> That's a topic for another day, screen time. So the world has grown closer due to technology, but guess what? We've gotten more distant, emotionally, socially, connecting. We have fake friends now. So I have 700 followers on Instagram. I don't know half of them, but they're following me and they will claim to know me so if we as adults are dealing with that, our children are dealing with that also. And we are from a heritage where there's communal living. There's always an uncle, an auntie. And for us Africans, Caribbeans, everybody's your uncle, everybody's your auntie. We moved here in 2004. And the friends that we had around that time, our children played together, grew up together, and they thought they were cousins. <laughs> up until, I think when the Saskatchewan nominee program came up, and then families got to invite real families over. And their real family came, and they were like, those are your cousins. And they're like, oh, now we have more cousins. <laughs> so how do you explain that those were fake cousins? <laughs> But that's part of the heritage that we bring with us. We stick together, we work together, we grow together, we cry together, and we laugh together. And as parents, we need to uphold that so that children will know that you can't survive on your own. You can't be an island. We are not built that way. We might be living in Canada now, and definitely they will imbibe some of the cultures which they have to. So newsflash. For every immigrant parent that's in the house today, when you retire, do you plan to go back to your home country, if you have one? Show of hands. You plan to go back to wherever you came from, where you retire. I see one over there. I see another one over there. Good. So the next question. When your children are all grown up and they're retired, are they going back to your home country? Did you note my question? I said, your home country. Because somehow, it's not their home country anymore. Because they're growing up here. So for them to see it as their home country, you have to do the work to make them embrace their heritage. To let them know their roots. Where did you come from? Where are your parents from? That's who you are, and now you're growing up in a different environment where you're learning new things, but that should not change the good values that your heritage possesses. The reality of the diaspora. So I have a few other things that are written down on my iPad, but I said, huh, I think we're tired. <laughs> Let's make it really quick. The reality of diaspora is that we bring the children here, or we give birth to them here, and they're growing up here, and things are different, and somehow we're trying to raise them as if they're back home. They're not. So I had the privilege of traveling to Nigeria last year, August, 
My sister turned 50. I have just one older sister. All the rest of my siblings are boys. I'm like, I gotta be there. So I took two of my kids home. So I have three, 21, eight, 21 years old, 19 years old, and 10 years old. Don't ask why the big gap, I went back to school. So anyway, I took the two youngest ones home. And you realize every step of the way, you have to give instruction. Don't put your hand out of the car. Don't leave your bag there. Don't do this. And to me, it will look like a normal thing they should understand not to do. But no, they were not raised in that environment. When grandpa or grandma or someone's talking to them and they're raising their voice, I already know what's going to happen, so I have to kind of step in and be like, that's what grandpa is trying to tell you. I have to intervene because they were not raised in that environment. So that brings me back to my question. Are they going back home when they're adults? 99%, they're not. So when we're raising them, we're raising them to thrive and flourish here. So as immigrant parents, we have no option but to assimilate some of the cultures of here. But make sure you've laid the foundation of what their heritage is and then guide them to merge both. The first way to guide them is when you're talking about your heritage or how you're living your life as a person of you know, black descent. Make sure it's enticing. <laughs> Make sure it's something nice that you want to be part of. And I'll use an example. If you're raised in Africa, let's use Africa for an example. There's aggression in your DNA, <laughs> whether you like it or not, because the environment will build that aggression into you. You're driving on the road. Ah, ah, it, you get to Canada, you hung the first time, and everybody looks at you and you're like, oh, they don't hung over here. It's built into us in Africa. For you to survive there, you must have a dose of aggression in you. And then you come to Canada and so, oh, oh, oh hold on, help get the door for you. Here you go. And you're like, okay. And I like how someone said this morning about how uh, she came across a senior, I think it was you, and you could see that she needed help, and you just jumped in to help. But you were supposed to say, oh, would you like some help? Well, where I'm from, if an elder is carrying something, you better be running <laughs> to go help them, or else your great-grandfather will hear about it. So how do we now pass that message across to the children we're raising here? So it won't be, your ancestors were rolled in their grave because you didn't help that senior. No. It's to be like, oh, sweetheart, it looks like that person might need some help. It would be really nice. Could you go help them? So you have to give your instru instruction from explanation first, and then you give the instruction. But where we were raised, it was instruction with the look. And if you don't react immediately, those eyes will burn a whole through, <laughs> through your neck. You know that you have to move. But it's different. So now give your child the look. Like, Mom, is something wrong with your eyes? <laughs> so those are the things we're dealing with. And we can't blame the children. It's not their fault. When parents complain to me, I'll be like, uh, they're children. You brought them here. Did you research here before you brought them? You signed them up for this. You are the adult. So find a solution to it. So I said I moved here 2004. And one of the first shockers we had was, I think it was 2006. Yes, I started nursing school in 2006. So everything you said resonated with me because I came in here with a five month old baby then had the second one, one and a half years later, and then went back to school for five years of nursing when they were three and one. So talk about teach my children language. When I have these big nursing textbooks to study, they didn't happen. 
So anyway, back to my story. So they started daycare when I went back to school. And the first culture shock we had was dad was playing with her. Whatever they were playing, I don't remember. And she said, don't be silly, dad. <laughs> yeah, I like the reaction that I got. <laughs> and if you know my husband, you can imagine what that reaction was. So here's the poor girl wondering what she said wrong. And here is dad, volcanic, vo volcano erupted. <laughs> and here is me trying to decide whose side <laughs> should I be on. And I wasn't a parenting coach then. So I guess it's been there. I just didn't know until it showed up. So anyway, girl crying, we sorted it out. I'm like, you can't say something like that so rude to your parent, blah, blah, blah. But now I fast forward to now. If a child said that, to me it's okay. But I'll call them aside and be like, you know, black for black people, there are certain things you don't say to adults. There will not be a volcanic eruption, but there will be an educating the child so they can learn. And that's what I'm saying about for our children, black people, to embrace our heritage, our culture, our way of life. It's in our hands how we present it to them. It's in our hands how we present it to them. We also have to understand that the children we are raising here now, they're living in a totally different environment, life, from what our parents raised us in. So what I have on the screen, kids come home from school, most of our African countries in the Caribbean, they have homework. Who remembers homework? Oh, yes. God help you if you don't do your homework and you show up in school the next day. It's like you're doing homework all night long. If there's no homework, you probably had to go do some chores for your mom. Maybe your mom had a store somewhere. You come back home, there is, it's not even chores, it's responsibilities waiting for you. You have to, because the environment, I don't know about, you know, I know they call us generator republic, but whatever, we played the soccer match and we beat some people. <laughs> you know, you get home, maybe there's even no power, and you still have to get supper done, you have to figure this out. So children were busy. There were things to keep them busy. But then you bring them here, it's winter for how many months of the year? They're indoors. No cousin living with you, no uncle or auntie living with you, it's just them. And you're a shift worker and you need to sleep. And these children are sitting around idle. And God help you if you say no screen time. So what are they doing? Nothing. So for maybe preteens and teenagers, it tends towards loneliness, depression, mental health situations that we black people don't like talking about, but it's there. For the younger one, then they're breaking your TV. I've heard of a child that broke a flat screen TV and I'm like, oh my God, okay. Or they are in front of a screen just watching TV all day long, all day long. And now their attention span is decreasing. And then they show up in school the next day, they've not slept well, they're not listening well, and then you're getting a phone call from school about your child's behavior, and then we want to show up at school and be like, oh, my child is well behaved. Yes, when you're there. When you're not there, maybe they're not. So we need to be a lot more open-minded about what we're doing with our heritage. So I'll run through this once. I think I've spoken about most of it. Your children will assimilate the culture faster than you. They will. Immigrant people, have your children told you you're speaking African English? <laughs> yeah, because they're younger. Their brains are still growing. They can pick up the accent faster. They will assimilate. And when they get to school, I like words I think it was Christian, right? The, you're the one working in the school, right? Yes. Like what he said about, you know, if, when he has a black child in his class or sees them at school, there's a connection there. But then when our children are out there and they don't see any, I was so excited about the 
cardiologist. I'm like, we have a black cardiologist. Wow, praise God, I'm so happy about that. So now maybe there's one of our kids, black kid, that's thinking, I would like to go into cardiology. But he looks around and is like, oh, who's going to mentor me? And then they give up on that dream. I heard about a black child that wanted to be a pilot. And I think it was Tefi, I think, I think it was Tefi that linked him up. They found someone that of African descent, a black man, that's a pilot. That was exciting. Our children growing up here, we have differing views about gender roles, academic pursuits, dressing, and all that. Have you heard of children that want to take a gap year after high school? So African parents in the house, black parents in the house, raise your hand if your child after grade 12 says, mom, I want to take a year off, what would your answer be? If it's a mission trip. If it's a mission trip, see, condition. I like that. So there are all of those things that they're battling with. So the best we can do is to be understanding, listen, get to know why, the why behind what they want to do. I will skip back to gender roles. So you have your black, we're black people, immigrant people, whatever you're doing in your home, and then they're making friends with their Caucasian friends, and they go there, and they notice that, oh, dad was cooking supper. So they're thinking, dad in the kitchen, <laughs> cooking? What was the mom doing? And now they come back home, and they look at dad like, I'll leave that topic for another day. <laughs> so those are some of the things that they're dealing with. Uh, discipline styles. Black people, how do we discipline? Are we authoritative or authoritarian from where we're from? So authoritative is when you explain and you say, okay, we'll do it this way, so let's do it this way. Authoritarian is when you say, I've spoken. So we can do that where we're from because that's the way things work there. But here, everybody deserves to be listened to. Now, I am not advocating for letting children get away with whatever. Authoritative parents means you have time to sit with them and let them tell you why they wanna do what they wanna do. And then you help them understand why that might not be a good idea. And one thing I've realized for us black people is when you sit with your children and you let them talk, sometimes they find the answer in the talk themselves. And you'll be like, oh. So I'll give an example. My 10-year-old wants to go to the mall with her friends to hang out at the mall. Uh, so the friends had already planned it. So she wants to, they invited her. So I said, oh, when are they going? Um, I'll ask them, so what are they planning to do? I'll just walk around the mall, okay. So who are the parents that are going with them? Oh, the spirits and spirits, okay. So I am supposed to release you after school to go with friends that I don't know. I don't know their parents, I don't know their phone number. When you're done at the mall, how will I know how to come pick you up? If anything happens to you, do they have my number? She goes, Oh, okay. I think I'll wait for the next one. Then I'll get their phone numbers. <laughs> I'll get their mommy's phone numbers and bring it to you. So that is where the conversation comes in with our children. We need to listen more than we talk. Because when you do that, you're helping them to think. You're helping them learn how to plan. Because we're not going to be here forever. Life wasn't planned that way. We're supposed to live before them, then they have to figure out life in our absence. So we have to train them. Some of the stuff that we deal with, coffee time, 7 p.m., if I'm not back in my father's house, even as a married woman, there will be salmon on the mountain that night. And then my child is telling me, 9 p.m. is too early. So we argued about that, and then finally, you know, me and dad were like, you know what, Saskatoon is pretty safe. She's got good head on her shoulders. She's a good driver. She's at her friend's house. We know where she's at. So maybe once in a while, she's 20 years old. <laughs> so maybe once in a while, we should just let her 
So that's an ongoing conversation in my house. <laughs> we need to let the children learn how to speak their mind. So the youths that were, I mean, you guys are not youths. I'm listening to the four of you and I'm like, there's hope, Amen. right? These are, these are our youths, these are our, and I think one of you said this is the now, it's not even the future anymore. Learning to speak your mind is something we need to teach our children as black folks. We were not raised to speak our minds. We grumbled, and God help you if your parents. <laughs> yeah. But now we can't do that. Because if we as adults are struggling this much as immigrants here, we can't afford to raise our children not being able to speak their minds. They need to be bold, they need to be courageous, they need to be able to sit at tables where they can fight for the next generation. Yeah. Okay. The children we are raising here, they want to fit in. They have not developed the skills to own their identity. And I was so happy when I found that picture of that um, boy and I put it up there. You can imagine, we've been watching Disney movies since when Cinderella, uh, this one, Sleeping Beauty. Did any one of them look like us? No. So this is dope. I agree. This is dope. As parents, we need to adapt and find reasonable strategies to parent successfully in diaspora. So I, will, I laughed when I found this picture. I said, oh my god, this is a typical African black family birthday picture. Like, who is even the celebrant? <laughs> You know, that's how we took pictures. Everybody has to hold the knife. So you can imagine raising a child here. Yeah, so I'll tell you this story. So I think when our oldest turned 10 and was like, oh, you're gonna have your birthday party, this and that, we're planning. So I already had my list out. And she looks at my list and she, says, she said something that shocked me. She said, but they are not my friends. And I was like, oh, she said, they're not my friends. So why are you inviting them to my birthday? And I'm, my brain is already calculating, it's my money, it's my house, you're living under my roof, you're eating my food. How dare you question who I'm inviting to your birthday party? But I kept quiet and I'm like, okay, so who would you like to invite? So she listed out the names. So now my black mom brain kicked in. What will she say that I didn't invite her daughter? Oh, what will he say that I didn't invite her son? Oh, what will they say that I didn't invite this? But I sat back and I looked at her and those are the people you want, okay. So what do you actually want for your birthday? Guess what? She just wanted a sleepover, movie night. You know why I agreed? Thank you. <laughs> that was why I agreed. But after that experience, it occurred to me that I'm not raising dummies. I'm not raising zombies. They have a mind and they can speak their mind. And if I brush something that simple to me, that simple aside, I might traumatize that child. And I know where we're from, we're like, trauma, come on, toughen up. There's no, 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 no. We need to let that go. There are a lot of traumatized teenagers and youths out there, black folks, lots of them out there. And when they tell you, what the issue is, sometimes you'll be taken aback. Yeah. That if, just if their parents knew, they would have changed that. And I'm gonna drop this in. Black folks, please apologize to your children when you're wrong. Oh, yes. We're so bad with that. Apologize. And I say to parents all the time, apologizing to your children doesn't, it doesn't reduce your authority over them. And sometimes what you're apologizing for, you don't believe it's an offense that you committed, but your child says it's an offense. So it's like getting pulled over by the cops and they're like, you did 80 in the 60 zone. And you're like, no, I did not. Yes, you did. I caught you on camera. <laughs> when they give you the ticket, what do you do? You pay it. You pay for it. So now that we're in diaspora, how can we make sure that we're building that heritage in our children. You have to be present and you have to be involved. Not present as in how our parents were present then that when dad got back from work, 
and honks, you rush to open the gate, and dad comes in and sits on his favorite chair and read newspaper and watches the news and eats and goes to bed. Present as in what happened at school today? Not, not closed-ended question. How was your day? So let me ask us all. How was your day? Hi. That's all. Conversation done. But tell me about your day. And you tell them about yours too. Build a conversation. Be involved. One rule of the term that I give new immigrants all the time is once your children start school, make sure you show up on day one. Go to that classroom. Meet that teacher. Look at who their friends are going to be. Show up off and on. Volunteer. I know we're busy, but find the time. Show up. They're your child. You have a right to know what's going on in that classroom. You have a right to ask questions. Be loving and compassionate. So when I moved here, 2004, along the line, you know, when I call home, conversation with my dad is always, how are you guys? How is everybody doing? The Lord be with you. I will keep praying for you. Okay, hold on for mommy. <laughs> that was it. But gradually along the line, we started talking even more than I would talk to mom. So be loving and compassionate. If you're not loving and compassionate, then we end up raising children that actually it's even different now. They won't even answer your call. Yeah, they won't even call you. There are children right now that are waiting to turn 18. And once they're 18, they're out. And you won't see them again. So we need to be very loving and compassionate. Yes, it hurt you. I'm sorry it hurt you. Not, come on, toughen up. Black people, black don't crack. No. <laughs> We have to let all of that go. Be their advocate and support them. Whether at school, they want to do art, they want to do swimming, they want to do something, support that. It matters to them. Open communication, there should be no taboo topics. They want to talk about sex, talk about sex. They have questions about drugs, talk about it. Because if you're not talking to them about it, Somebody someone else is. And you don't know who that someone else is. Build a new village around you. Now you're in a new place. Who are your friends? Who are you know, community members? Build a village around your children so they have people to bounce ideas off. Plan with the future in mind. And that's when I was asking, are your children going back to your home country? Later in life, probably not. So build them for here. Build them to last here. Build them to know that we're here and we're going to make it work. I think I'm getting close. OK. so. That's the end of my presentation. I decided to make it short. Anybody has any question? Thank you. And I have uh, my books at the table out there, if anybody would like an autographed copy. Thank you so much.